Hello and welcome to this KSPS election special. I'm your host, Doug Nad Vornick. This November, voters living in the city of Spokane will have the opportunity to vote on two bond issues. One would fund an ambitious construction plan for Spokane Public Schools. The other would build three new city libraries and enhance four others. Because the city and the school board have formed an innovative partnership to share resources on these projects, we've asked representatives from both parties here to explain their plans. From the city, we have Mayor David Condon and the executive director of the Spokane Public Library, Andrew Chance. From Spokane Public Schools, we have Superintendent Shelley Redinger and Associate Superintendent Mark Anderson. So let's dig into the uh, kind of the itemizing the two. $495 million bond issue for the schools, $77 million for the libraries. Let's start with the schools. So give me kind of the, uh, the Cliff Notes version, the highlights of, the, of the, uh, that big bond issue. Well, the, the need behind the bond is to reduce overcrowding at our elementary schools and get class size down to the new state requirements of about 20 students per teacher in K through three. And to do that, uh, we need to move our sixth graders into middle schools. And to do that, we need three additional middle schools across our system in order to have a six, seven, eight middle school configuration, which uh, we've studied that the last few years, and it's actually a, a better configuration for our students academically and socially. And so the big ask in this particular bond is for those uh, th uh, three new middle schools, plus we've got three old middle schools. Glover, Sacagawea, and Shaw that all need to be replaced. They've reached the end of their useful life. So those are the big items that are in our bond. So how did you figure out where to put the new middle schools? Well, we've been working very uh, collaboratively with the city on land that the city has and that we could partner with and so that we're not charging taxpayers twice for the same uh, plot of land. And so that's where we really came to look at where to put them. Also, we want to site them evenly throughout the school district to help with enrollment. Okay, so this gives us a good chance then to talk about kind of the highlights of the, the library bond issue, Andrew. So for the need for the library, it's really about uh, the time and place where those facilities were originally built, uh, which was in the early 90s. Uh, no significant investment has been made in those facilities, so we have a lot of basic needs around uh, the infrastructure of roofing, carpets, HVACs, things like that, that we spend a lot of money uh, just in maintaining those facilities. The other is that you know, they were built in the, in, the, in the 90s, and that's before technology really took a hold uh, for the community. Uh, so uh, literacy means a different thing uh, in today's world, and we need to be able to address that for everyone in the community. So in order to do that, we need to make more intentional spaces uh, for the libraries. So which libraries would be new, which would be renovated? Right, so new, uh, one would be a partnership with Spokane Public Schools uh, where we would take the Hilliard Library that serves uh, the Northeast community and have a joint use facility over at the Shaw uh, Middle School campus. We'll be able to increase the footprint of that facility. Uh, for East Central, we'll be doing a replacement library at Liberty Park. Again, expanding the footprint of the East Central Library so we can create more intentional services and spaces for the community. The third new location would be in partnership again uh, with Spokane Public Schools. They have a piece of property just north of the Libby Center uh, and we'd be able to uh, really recognize that the I-90 is a divide in our community and allow services to happen uh, on that side of the, the highway. The rest uh, will be renovations, uh, so we'll do an expansion at Shadel, and uh, South Hill and Indian Trail will also maintain where they're currently at, and we'll do some modernization at those facilities as well as downtown. Okay, so we got pretty deep into what the library is doing. There are things we didn't mention about the school uh, bond issue. What are, what are some of the down-ballot projects, so to speak? So uh, for Lewis and Clark High School, uh, we are actually in the design phase out of our last bond for an eight-classroom addition. It's our largest high school. But they are the one high school that does not have a cafeteria or commons. Uh, and so as safety and security have become more of a concern across the nation and in Spokane as well, uh, being able to close that campus, keep students on campus for lunch, and then also have a commons that's used for lots of other student functions. So what's on the bond uh, uh, here in November is to actually build a, them a commons and cafeteria connected to that new addition. Another one is uh, On Track Academy is a uh, uh, 
10, 11, 12 uh, hands-on project-based high school. It's currently in portables next to the Spokane uh, Skills Center, and we would actually give them a permanent facility connected with the Shaw and Hilliard Library projects. So that would make a really nice big uh, uh, multi-use campus uh, from, from birth to, to seniors uh, and seniors in high school as well. Then the other two big components in our bond is uh, we do security out of the bond. That's how we fund all of the security measures. We're having a national firm study our school district this year on safety and security. What else needs do we need to do to keep our students and staff safe? So having some funding for whatever their recommendation is. Technology, this is how we fund our technology. All of our computers for students, our infrastructure. So that'll keep that going for our, our staff. Then finally is what we call our smaller building improvement projects. Every school gets something out of the bond. It could be new playground equipment, it could be a new roof, it could be a boiler, it could be an office remodel, a room remodel. So those kinds of things are um, done every year uh, to keep our schools well maintained and meet changing program needs. So before we get to some of the, uh, the finances, I want to bring the mayor into the conversation here. Give me a little history lesson as to how the, you know, that, that, that school, I use the word bromance between uh, the school district and the, and the city of Spokane. How did that come about? Well, you know, it's been a great partnership with the superintendent and the Spokane Public Schools from day one. Uh, we have been working on program uh, uh, projects together. I actually had an FTE, uh, uh, an employee in the, in the mayor's office. We never filled that position. Instead, we've used those resources for uh, issues of mutual uh, of interest between uh, the superintendent's office and the school district and, and the city. The number one reason why people buy a house in the neighborhood they buy it is in the schools. Uh, we have long been on a track to be the city of choice. We do that through, obviously, a top tier school system and we have that and what's exciting is as we kept on going uh, then we also looked at another opportunity and that is part of our joint strategic plan with the city council and that was how do we look at property that the city owns and do we leverage it for the citizens best benefits for years the city has acquired land for different reasons and many times those reasons uh, didn't come to fruition or have expired for the reason and we're still holding on to this land and so this really gave us an awesome opportunity as we furthered that initiative with with our joint strategic plan and looked at these opportunities with the school district, with the libraries, and said, how do we use these? And, and really, it's partnerships across the board. But what's really exciting is then to see that this is the capital investment, the buildings uh, for the programs that are really why people are coming to our school district. Uh, I mean, I am very excited to see the growth in, in the school district and kids uh, coming into the Spokane Public Schools as, as, a, as, a, as a real uh, reality and really the portfolio system that Spokane Public Schools is, is, is what people want today. Mm -hmm. and, and that's how you build a strong school and a strong city. So if my math is correct, 495 million plus 77 million equals 572 million dollars. That's a lot of cash for a city of 200,000 folks. Mm -hmm. And yet you're saying that the, the uh, property taxes are going to go down. So how does that work? So a unique time in our history uh, with the uh, McCleary decision uh, where the McCleary family sued the state for not fully funding basic education and prevail. And the state Supreme Court holding the legislature's feet to the fire to fund basic ed. It really changed for Spokane the whole funding system for schools. Uh, so our educational program levies were as high as $4 uh, per thousand of assessed valuation. What's happened is, is the, now the new state funding is they're taking over more of the state funding, dropping our local levy to $1.50 per thousand. Uh, they did add a new state school tax, property two, uh, state school tax two for a dollar per thousand. But the net difference for Spokane taxpayers is a reduction starting this next year of two dollars and twenty cents per thousand of assessed valuation. So this opportunity is saying, will you invest 98 cents of your tax drop in libraries and schools and keep the other dollar twenty two as a tax rate reduction? This is really exciting because the citizens get uh, the tax relief. Uh, and now they get to vote on an investment that either would have come into fruition three years from now, which the school district would have been on their regular uh, rotation. So they have now agreed that that wouldn't happen if this was moved up. And then also, 
What's exciting is uh, the investment into our libraries, which that bond uh, expired in 2008, uh, roughly yeah. in, that, in that time frame. And this is continued uh, investment in education. Uh, so this isn't just other projects around the city that we decided to fund. This is specifically for education, access to knowledge in new and innovative ways, whether it be the ones we've already spoken of, you know, the first ever uh, coordination between the school district and the library system, whether it be at the new uh, facility by the Lib Libby Center or the new one um, at Shaw, or even the partnership that the library board is going to endeavor on with the park board. And so now you will have really a lifestyle campus at Liberty Park where you have a library, a swimming pool, a park, very similar to what we have at Shadle. And that's exciting for that neighborhood. Um, and we haven't seen that level of investment in some of our uh, more vulnerable neighborhoods in, in decades. And this is really that opportunity uh, that we can do this. So I want to stay just for one more minute on the, uh, the financials. If the state property tax has gone up as, as, a, as a way of funding the schools, well, if you include this with the increase in the state property tax, will most people see an increase, a decrease, stay level? How will that work? They'll actually see a decrease in, in all of their taxes. So you have a school levy, which will be $1.50. You'll have the school debt service levy for the bond. You'll have the, uh, there's always been a state school property tax, but this new state property tax too, when you put them all together, they're still down about $2.20. Okay. So there's a third item that's on the ballot, and that is that relates to football stadiums or sports stadiums, I guess we should say. So let's talk about that. So uh, as uh, uh, Shelley said, we need to build three new middle schools. Uh, the city has provided us property in the northeast across oh. from Foothills, uh, which now is just dirt piles, and great spot for a northeast middle school. Place on the south hill next to Mullen Road for a middle school. And then the third site is at Albee Stadium. We actually own the dirt parking lot, 20 acres there at Alvey that we swapped with the city a few years ago. City still owns the stadium. We've been running it uh, each year, uh, getting a credit toward the purchase. I don't own it yet. But we really, our plan all along is we have to build a small stadium there. We don't need a big 30,000 seat stadium. Re Alvey's reached the end of its useful life. It's pretty much crumbling as we were trying to keep it up. But to build a new middle school in the parking lot, we have to have a small stadium. So there is a stadium on our, the school bond and a middle school that will go at the Albee site. Well, this is a pretty popular question at the kind of the joint city council school board meeting a month or so ago with, a, uh, with $570 million on the ballot, and this is what people wanted to talk about. So, Mayor, what, tell us a little bit more it about It came about the, very uh, frankly as we looked at leveraging city-owned property, and so we did this with Joe Albee in my first it, part of my administration. The city used to operate uh, the stadium. Mm -hmm. We were not in the stadium operating business. Uh, so the school system took that over, but we also have a dramatic need for field space, for youth sports. Um, and, you know, it's unfortunate now in some respects that a lot of the sports uh, are played in, in clubs, and, so, and you, club, you play them uh, on tournaments, on weekends, and so you need a lot of fields in the same place. Um, and a lot of times in order to get those uh, uh, fields, the, the teams have to travel out of town. And I think that's unfortunate because I think kids should be able to stay here and it's much more expensive to travel for families. And so um, we started to look at other opportunities of where we could put fields. And of course the city has a great facility in Merkel, but now if we end up putting a new stadium there, we wouldn't have those, that option. And so we started to look around and a great partnership with Public Facilities District and the, um, and the Spokane uh, Park System would give us the opportunity to put that stadium uh, on the North Bank. And really what it does is it completes a, a sports complex where you have a field house which is under design and will be built with current funds, uh, really focused on indoor court sports uh, and track. And then you would have a long field, a, you know, a stadium for soccer, for football, for lacrosse, for band, for other services or other programming also, and then you'd have the arena. And what's really exciting is to have the Public Facilities District come on board because 
they run facilities. This is what they do. And so to have the school district and the public facilities district come together, and not only that, but then you truly do have a field and a stadium that uh, is going to be multi-purpose because not only will it be used uh, by the school district, but now the public facilities district could have other organizations use that and or uh, those from out of town. You know, we have the big uh, B basketball tournament. Mm -hmm. What if we had the B football or lacrosse or those other championships uh, uh, that could come to our to our community. So people are questioning where where is everybody going to park if you're going to put a stadium there. So what what are the plans for that? What's really exciting is um, uh, we really have studied the parking issue uh, quite a bit, but all in downtown and throughout the downtown area. And uh, within 1,500 feet of that stadium uh, is thousands of parking spots that we have never uh, looked at. Uh, and that's in the private sector. No one has ever asked, and so many of the office buildings there have never opened up their parking to anything to do with the arena. We have, uh, they have uh, seen what's happening and literally uh, have come to the table saying we would offer up our parking. Now that would be the typical parking that would be for charge like you see at other events, but the commitment from the public facility district and they control enough parking on their own property that the the facilities and the games that would go on for the school district would be free to uh, to the participants and the spectators for that and so it really is an opportunity um, and already there's a parking garage being built uh, on the private sector uh, that actually expanded their size so that they could be available uh, to that so during uh, some of your hearings, I, I think I've heard people say, why is the school district spending $30 million on a sports stadium? Mm -hmm. So what's your answer to that? Well, that's what they cost. Uh, and we do have high school sports, both uh, soccer and uh, football. Lacrosse is becoming uh, a more popular sport. It's about, uh, um, it's not as much as an elementary school. Uh, it's certainly about half of what it costs to build a new middle school these days. So it's a needed facility. and. Um, High school athletics are an important part of the high school experience, and uh, so uh, it's something that we need. Folks have asked us, why don't you just improve all the fields at each of your high schools? Right. To do that, even small stadiums, we only have about two high schools that have enough parking to be able to fit a stadium at their high schools. Uh, many of our high schools are in the urban core, North Central, uh, Rogers, uh, LC doesn't even have a field. They, theirs is up in a neighborhood. So to put in lights and stands and try to get enough parking, it just, and it costs more actually to be able to do five fields versus just one. So it's this more efficient for an Much more district. central location, doesn't right. have the impact on the adjoining neighborhoods. Right. Um, and really then truly becomes a multi-purpose field because now it's available for other community events. Um, and really the infrastructure there on the North Bank, when you talk about the intelligent traffic systems on Division and, and Maple Ash are much better prepared that right now Joe Albee is in a neighborhood. The closest mm -hmm. traffic control you have is a blinking light. Uh, and so really allows you to deal with traffic in a much, uh, much more efficient way than actually where it's located today. So depending on how that, uh, whether the folks vote uh, yes or no as, as to or which of the two, how would you proceed from then? So it will be important. That will be an advisory vote for the board, the school board. And so that third item on the ballot, which is the advisory vote, um, the board will take that into consideration as they deliberate um, if the bond passes where, you know, where they would like to place it. I think they'll really take that very seriously. I know that as I've talked with them about, you know, what does the public want and where would they prefer the location? There's one other issue that was really raised during that, uh, that particular uh, hearing, and that was regarding a dog park up on the South Hill. Now, I've not been to this dog park, but tell me about it and why are people why is it so important to people here? You know, what's exciting about this partnership is as these issues arise, a, a location where people have been walking their dogs, a, and not a recognized dog park, but an area that had been, quite frankly, property that the city owned and had been, in the citizen's perspective, leveraged to its best use, which was a, a location to, to walk dogs. What's exciting now is you're going to get an enhanced in the work that Mark and Rick did and with the school district's um, uh, planners and, and architects, really now a true dog park that's actually you know, much more uh, functional uh, for that. And I think we'll continue to see this, whether it be uh, a central location for the stadium. You'll see this type of teamwork coming together 
you'll see the same thing as the library builds out its facilities in, in conjunction with, and, and the team is coming together to be problem solvers with the adjoining neighborhoods to really have the best asset. And this is what this is about. This is about investing in assets uh, that really change what our community looks like. Remember these also, I mean, back to the recreation side, the middle schools have a significant mm -hmm. amount of play fields that yes, are used during the school day, used during the school season, but are really available to, to the community. And these have you know, large areas uh, of athletic fields because now in the middle schools, that's where you start playing sports. And so logically, these are gonna become even you know, better assets in, in those neighborhoods. And I think that's what's exciting. So there really is a huge benefit uh, to our community. And again, at a time uh, that the citizens will still get tax relief through this and, and get to vote on uh, using those dollars that yes, they have traditionally spent on education, will continue to spend them on education. Um, so you just got me to thinking, uh, it's a bond issue, so it's not a simple majority, is it? Correct, 60 Correct. percent yeah, plus, okay. super majority. And are there, there's also a, a validation requirement. Are right. you worried about reaching the, the validation requirement? It's like 40 percent. With the current general election, no, I think uh, it, it'll be enough folks voting that uh, it, that won't, validation won't be a problem. Okay. I'm going to go back to the libraries here because, Andrew, you've been in libraries for your, your career. And how have, uh, when I, I worked at the, the downtown library when it was before the, the current system and we'll, I used to work in the, in the basement and we'd send up, you know, big bulky newspaper bundles and I don't think I've ever seen a newspaper bundle at my local library or anything like that. So how have libraries changed and how are you designing your 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 libraries to, to adopt that? Right, so you know back in the day they were designed around books and, and now we design them around people. Uh, how do people function in their learning, in their collaboration and in, in their sharing? Uh, so it's, it's, it's much more uh, project-based, it's much more flexible in design because the way that you know, reading and, and information sharing has changed. Uh, it's, it, sometimes it's noisier, sometimes, uh, and, and that's part of the conflict that we're looking to resolve in some of our spaces is none of our spaces have quiet study rooms. Uh, so to provide that outlet for folks that, you know what, you still need that quiet place, we still want to provide that for the community. Um, it's the, the needs are just so much more diverse. Uh, we serve birth to seniors uh, and their needs throughout the day change and, and the changes that we're looking to make will, will make the spaces a lot more flexible. Several years ago, the, the city reduced its library hours because of budgetary constraints. If you've got new libraries, are you going to essentially tell the people that we're going to keep them open so you can, you know, you can come on Sunday, you can, you know, on, on Saturdays and that's... You know, I think one of the major accomplishments that we, uh, accomplishments that we had with the levy dollars that uh, extended our hours was we did more. Uh, than we had promised for with those dollars. You know, we added Sunday hours on Shadle and, uh, Shadle and South Hill. That wasn't part of the original plan. We found ways to do more for the community. We're gonna continue to do that. Uh, we're a, a pretty smart organization when it comes to delivering the most service we can directly to the customer. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll continue to have those extended hours. So I just want to go back one more time uh, to talk about the sixth graders and the, and the K-3. So give me an idea of how that changes things at, in terms of middle school. Uh, does it yes. change the way that you teach at middle schools? Yes, and that we have a number of task forces right now working on that with staff, community uh, leaders, and parents on the committee, really giving input on what should, what should a 6, 7, 8 school look like. Um, that is more the norm of a model throughout our country. However, we want to make sure that we're doing it with the best practices in place as we implement it. Um, and then that allows K-5 at the elementary schools, that gives us more space to use classrooms for what they were supposed to be used for. Right now we're using spaces for classrooms that weren't intended for that, like our stages. Um, and art rooms, they can go back to being what they were intended for. And um, then that allows us to meet the class size um, focus and the goals that the state has asked for. So what's, what's the number that the, the state requires you to get down to for K-3? Well, it's an average uh, f across our district, and it's an average for K-3, and currently we include specialists in that number, so it's about a 1 to 21, uh, would, would you say that's about the ratio? It's 1 to 17, on, but what you'll see in your home room 
is mm -hmm. around 20 students, yeah, 20, 21 students. And that's the average. There'll be some lower um, right. as some course lower, in, some higher. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So if the, if the bond issue is approved, in what order do you go? Mm. Oh, that's a good question. So uh, we will phase in, because uh, it'll take us six years to get all the middle schools built. Andrew plans to do his library projects over a six-year period. So we will start with the north side. Uh, Shaw has already been in the master planning stage in this bond. So Shaw, Foothills, uh, Glover, and the stadium, whatever we end up naming it, those will be first probably take three years to get them open. And then the south uh, side middle school will be next probably about year four or five. So that'll be the order of, of um, moving the students up. So uh, Mayor Condon mentioned the fact that you're, you're kind of moving in early, three years early. How does that affect mm. the, uh, the price? Uh, how would it be, what would the price mm. be if you were doing this three years from now? So if we had stayed on our normal 2015 to 2021 cycle where we had run our next bond in 21, these same projects we estimate due to construction costs, escalation would probably cost us about $100 million more just to do the same project. So that's another advantage of, yeah. of doing it now. Our, and then our cycle would shift and it would be 2018 to 2024 would be the six year phase and we wouldn't run a 2021 bond. Hmm. So what would you focus on in that, that bond six years from now? Still have a lot of old schools. So we've got uh, the Madison's Indian Trails, Balboa's, uh, all of our special schools like Libby is, is one of those, uh, Bryant, um, Bancroft. So we still have several schools in the inventory that need to be renovated or replaced. Okay, Andrew, what order would you do yours in? We'll likely start with Liberty Park. Uh, uh, that provides uh, more capacity for South Hill because we know that 50% of our users in that neighborhood travel further to utilize the South Hill Library. And then we'll likely focus on uh, Shadle. Obviously, we'll be working in, conduct, uh, in conjunction with Shaw and, and, and Hilliard. Downtown's going to take a little bit longer, so we'll start, but you wouldn't see you know, the results of that un until later. And then uh, South Hill and Indian Trail will likely do in tandem uh, as you know, the minor uh, upgrades that we're looking at. So how do you do that when you're trying to run a library at the same <laughs> site too? I mean, at least in your case, you can build on the other side of, of a lot as Correct. you're doing on many of, uh, right. I think you did that on Salk. Yeah, and, with Glover, and, Zach, and Shaw will build on, the, on their play fields and keep school in operation and then take down the old schools after we get yeah. in operation. And, and we can do that with Hilliard and, and East Side, you know, because we'll be building new sites. Um, what we're going to really have to maintain is, you know, that open public access and, and still get the projects done. Uh, we'll likely be renting, leasing some temporary spaces for some of the, the like the shadle redo, um, and uh, that will help uh, still allow for service in the area. Okay, we're in our last minute or so. Is there anything that I missed that you wanted to make sure that the public knew about in terms of either of these bond issues? I think it's a very rare opportunity as we see the tax rate come down uh, some $2.20 to ask the voters on a very innovative partnership that is saving uh, money, but most importantly is a generational investment in our number one asset as a city, and that is our schools and libraries, access to knowledge, lifelong learning, um, and, and how we truly build community. And, and so to me, uh, this is an opportunity that we won't get again. Um, and takes what had been money invested in our, in our education and access to knowledge and, and continues that, not in yesterday's school system or yesterday's library system, but really the way we will learn um, in school and lifelong learning uh, going forward. I just I want to say I just think it's really a unique partnership, mm -hmm. a unique opportunity, just the way that we're all working together. I think really is is historic, truly, and uh, this I think doing it now allows a better learning environment for all of our students and for our community and libraries right away rather than waiting. Okay, well that's a good place to finish. I want to thank our guests for their help in explaining these important bond issues, both the library bond issue and the school bond issue. Uh, the libraries we are talking about again are a convenient place for you to drop off your ballot or you can uh, drop them off in the nearest mailbox. Uh, please do so by November 6th. Thank you for watching our program. I'm Doug Nanborning.